Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Glenn Hutchins, chairman of North Island and co-founder of Silver Lake Partners. Glenn, great to see you. Great to be with you, Andy. So you have been a tech investor for decades now as the co-founder of Silver Lake, one of the premier tech uh, private equity firms, the first private equity firm in tech. And I'm wondering what you think about investing in tech right now, Glenn, particularly the Magnificent Seven. Well, a couple of things. One is that um, over the course of my career as a technology investor, um, Gartner has described the cycles we go through as the hype cycle. Uh, and we're right now in the AI hype cycle, uh, ha ha having handed uh, the peak of the hype cycle from crypto to AI. Crypto then went in the trough of despair, and now it's come back out again and is in the uh, period of... Uh, Adoption. So AI, you have to understand, first of all, that AI today is the great fad in investing. All the venture investors who said they're never going to do another fad, they, 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 if they learn their, their lesson with all the growth stuff and all the crypto stuff are now all saying, with the exception of AI. And there's this massive increase in AI investing. Uh, and we can come back to that, but right now that's the major thing that's going on. Uh, and there's a little bit of a bubble there. Uh, secondly, uh, the bubble that we just came out of, uh, which was one largely focused on uh, growth investing, late stage venture, but also some venture in which some very, very experienced firms with lots of money put a huge amount of money to work at very high valuations very quickly. Uh, and those, the markdowns on those are now just started to ramify its way through. The, um, the system largely um, expressed at the portfolio value of the large institutions that invested with those firms. Uh, that takes a fair amount of time to work its way because there are liquids through the valuation process. Mm -hmm. But one of the results is that the, we're in a little bit of, a, outside of AI, a little bit of a venture nuclear winter, and especially a growth nuclear winter, uh, as the um, effects of the large amount of money that was put in high valuations now marked down, but with no sense of what the real value is is working their way through the system. I think those are the two major things that are going on right now. Right, I want to get back to AI, but specifically, what about those big platform companies like Apple, like Meta, like Alphabet, like Microsoft, Amazon? Do they hold too much sway over the economy and or are they good investments? Well, you know, you'd have to take each of them apart individually. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that, you have things like Apple is worth more than the GDP of France, gives you some kind of sense of the uh, dimensionalizing the problem and thinking it through. On the other hand, these are big companies that have been very successful, have very important products, which we're all consumers of. Um, and so are they, are their valuations things you kind of worry a little bit about? Have they gotten potentially ahead of themselves in terms of value? Maybe. Are they real companies that are changing the world and producing products and services that are important to us? For sure. That's a very different thing than what's in venture and growth portfolios, which yeah. are companies that might not survive, right. absent funding. That's a very different kind of thing. But I think, you know, the, they are weird. Look, the stock market's here hitting record prices, record levels. Those seven companies are, you know, a predominant amount of the stock market value. So you have to pause a little bit on their valuations. Right. And what about AI? I mean, the two big plays, obviously, are NVIDIA almost completely, and then I guess Microsoft and some others as well. Right. So in terms of AI, the way I think about it is, um, ChatGPT was a product demo that caught the imagination of the world. And you know when your Uber driver is asking you about a technology phenomenon that it's gotten to a level that's, um, uh, you know, it's the old Joe Kennedy and the shoeshine boy type of thing about stocks, right? Um, so my th view about AI, which I've been following uh, for years, uh, you know, we all have AI in many of our products. It's just, just these generative AIs has now gotten people's attention versus machine learning, which came before it, is that what it essentially is going to do, in my view, is commoditize all the information out on the Internet with a bunch of copyright battles along the way, right? And then the magic is going to come from taking those LLMs, the large language models, and combining them with your own proprietary data inside your walled garden, of your company, and then using vertical AI applications to, to do things inside your business. 
So I think that the magic for as a technology implementation, when AI goes through its trough of despair and comes back out again with widespread implementation, is going to be implementing in verticals like consumer uh, service or fraud detection or basic software design inside individual companies. So I think what we're seeing right now is just a large product demo that's captured the world's imagination, but it's not, not what the application of AI is going to be in, in commercially. Right, just to pick up on that, um, so you're saying you anticipate a trough of despair, so it'll unfed, if you will, and then... It won't but, change but, the world the way everybody expects, and something else will capture our imagination. Right, but you anticipate that it's for real. I mean, it's oh, not, yeah, the, not, the, not the metaverse. No, of course. Yeah, no, right? that's right. Well, the metaverse, wait, the metaverse Met could be back at some point. So, right. again, that was part of the uh, crypto um, hype cycle. Right. Uh, but, you know, the video, what's going on with video gamings? Uh, gaming, gaming is creating a fair amount of what we call right. the metaverse. I want to switch over and ask you about the Fed. Um, should we all just take a moment and applaud Jay Powell for catching back up to the cycle and then engineering a soft landing? Look, I'm a big fan of Jay Powell and flatter myself to be a friend. So I think yes. Um, uh, but um, uh, I think that uh, catching back up, I'm, we can talk about whether that's the right way to think conceptualize it or not. But I think what's happened here is a couple of things are going on. First is um, it's, we, the economy has proven to be much more resilient to increased interest rates than we had anticipated. Uh, and it raises an important question of if over the last period of years since 9-11, uh, if we had needed that huge amount of liquidity in the marketplace and near zero interest rates to get, let our economy get through these kind of crises. Right, because uh, we've been able to tolerate much higher rates than we would have expected. Uh, and I think it's, that's a very, very healthy thing because having a price for capital facilitates capital being allocated in an efficient way so it doesn't go in to, uh, when it's priced at zero, doesn't go into economic uh, um, structures or deals or applications or investments that aren't credit worthy. Right. Aren't investor worthy, so I think having a positive cost of capital is a very, very positive thing for the allocation of capital mm. in, in the economy, and that's kind of where we are right now. So it feels, feels very healthy. As also, which it doesn't necessarily feel to me like you have to in, reduce interest rates to get back to something that we expect to have, because economic activity, growth is good, unemployment is good, stock markets is very high. So we're this. Uh, effect of higher interest rates on economic activity that people have feared is not occurring necessarily. And the only thing the Fed is worried about, I think, right now is if they overshoot. It, so when you, the only impetus for me to bring down interest rates would be if they fear a weakening of economic activity that they need to counteract. Right, so you're not anticipating big rate cuts this year? No, I mean, and, and if we do have big rate cuts this year, I think it would be a negative because mm. it would indicate the Fed concerned about economic activity. And I'm not anticipating rate increases either because inflation right. seems to be cooling off. Look at inflation year over year, six months over six months, quarter over quarter, month over month. It's all going in the right direction. Right. I just made this sign. This is the international sign for plateau. Right. Or we might, maybe it's some sort of equilibrium, Goldilocks, et cetera, kind of thing? Well, I think, you know, uh, H equilibrium is on its way to another disequilibrium because that's wow. just human nature, right? Yeah. So, but I f it feels like the Fed has managed us to a place where inflation is kind of out of the system. But don't forget, it leaves behind a massive increase in prices that are a new level that people are still facing. And that's mm -hmm. a, a very large socio-political phenomenon that is worth pausing on. I mean... So the legacy of inflation right. is still bad. It's still there and it's still bad. And consumer sentiment seems to be picking up. People still are complaining and grousing like they always do. What do you think this means for the political environment, in particular, of course, Biden versus Trump? Look, I think that um, so I'm not licensed to practice politics. I'm a policy guy. You worked in Washington. Yeah, but in policy. Mm -hmm. not running elections or making political decisions. And so that's not my area of expertise at all. Uh, and so from an economic point of view, I think that um, we have to, under, to recognize the impact of the s several years of inflation, creating higher prices, higher price levels, eroding the value of people's savings, 
causing many people's wages on an inflation adjusted basis to fall behind. Um, uh, and things like tuition and student loans and all these other uh, house prices, things being, being out of reach for a lot of people, even though the economy is still, is still good from a macroeconomic perspective with respect to, as we talked about, inflation, unemployment, those sort of things. So it's, a, um, you, it's not a time to declare victory. It's not a time to, uh, not a time to say it's a great economy and it's, so one, it's such and such is fault. Or it's a bad economy and it's someone's fault. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an accurate portrayal of the picture as we're doing a lot better than we had reason to expect at this point. But there's still a bunch of issues out there that we need to be cognizant of that average people are facing. Right. I have to ask you about Harvard, Glenn. You have myriad connections to the university. Three degrees. Um, you served on the Harvard Management Committee. You have the Hutchins Center for African uh, American and African Research there, um, and maybe something I've forgotten. So anyway, obviously the situation there has been fraught. Uh, right. The president stepped down. Um, there's been pressure by Bill Ackman. What is your take on things there? You know, I'm. Um, uh, Three degrees of separation away from it. <laughs> you say, thankfully, is that, <laughs> thankfully do I detect, yeah, yeah. detect that? Um, mm -hmm. But I, look, I think it's uh, uh, Claudine Gay's resignation is a very sad event on a human level. I think we have to acknowledge that um, for her and her community. Um, the uh, the culture of universities broadly, I think, has gotten meaningfully out of sync with society and needs to be addressed. Uh, and this is not a Harvard comment. Uh, and um, the corporate governance of those organizations, I think, need, probably needs to be scrutinized and modernized. Right. So if I'm to read into that, there's some people have some points on all sides of the equation, right? You know, that's a very complicated issue that I'm not, I haven't delved into, not expert in, but I just think that those, that's kind of how I think about it. Fair enough. Crypto, we mentioned, uh, has been another interest of yours, but it Correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like you dial back a little bit from it. No, I don't. You know, the uh, it's always interesting what people want to talk to me about. So, you know, Chat GPT was I said earlier was it introduced as a product demo, and all of a sudden the world wanted to talk about it. It caught everybody by who was in, involved in AI by surprise that that was what caught people's attention. People all wanted to talk about that. So, people wanted to talk to me about crypto for the last couple of years because I was experimenting on it as an investor, and as a fintech investor. And, but I always said um, that I recommend if people want to be engaged in it, to put no, no more than 1% to 2% of your investable assets into it. Right? So, and I, so in terms of dialing back, I still think that's the kind of right way to think about it if you're interested in that, not, not to go whole, whole hog into it. Um, but I think right now um, we're reaching the point where, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the couple things. One is Bitcoin has proven its product market fit as a store of value, as a digital store of value. So, for instance, when um, Silicon Valley Bank failed, Bitcoin prices went way up. Why? Because a fair amount of the young tech people who took their money out of Silicon Valley Bank put it into Bitcoin. Because they knew they didn't trust banking to begin with, and then with Silicon Valley Bank, their, their views were validated, right? So it's a digital store of value. Um, the stable coins are a, uh, a, a means of... Uh, Transactions. The stablecoin network now uh, operates on a daily basis at two thirds to three quarters the size of the Visa network. Hmm. So, it's meaningful, meaningful, uh, you know, means of exchange. And then there is a whole the the blockchain is being used in, to represent uh, ownership and to record ownership in entirely new ways uh, that are very valuable and are starting to increase in value. I mean, even, even J.P. Morgan, where Jamie Dimon says he's against crypto, is implementing blockchain technologies inside the organization. Uh, and so I think you're starting to see real use cases and real product market fit after the hype cycle and the trough of despair, now the hard work of, of, of implementing the new technology. And I think the key thing here is to create a regulatory environment in which both the industry can stay in the United States right, um, because other jurisdictions are, make, are creating much friendlier regulatory environments, um, and um, which pro provides clarity so the players in the industry can actually work within the boundaries of the law and regulation and feel confident that they're doing the right thing because they want to. Right. You have a number of different interests and, and jobs, in fact. We'll get to a couple of them. Um, 
you uh, have long been involved in the Brookings Institution. Right. There's a new CEO there, or a new president there, I guess. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Well, she's terrific. Um, Cecilia Rouse. Um, uh, when we went to look for a new uh, uh, chief executive of Brookings, my um, objectives were to find someone who was a world-class scholar. Check. Cecilia was a professor at Princeton uh, Economics, worked very closely with Claudia Golden, who recently won the Nobel Prize. Uh, someone who had managed an um, academic institution, check. Uh, she had managed what used to be called the Woodrow Wilson School, now called SPIA, the School of, Pro of Pop Political uh, and International Affairs. I think it's tongue twister. Public International Affairs, SPIA, mm -hmm. yeah, tongue twister. Someone who understood how policy was made in Washington, check. She had worked in policy and making roles in the last three Democratic White Houses, including uh, um, being cha chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for um, uh, Joe Biden, and having Ted Cruz vote for her nomination, mm. right? So yeah. non-political. Um, someone who um, embraced raising money as something you had to do in these jobs, equivalent to being a college president, and someone with a vision for the future for Brookings. So I think she's terrific. We ran a very lengthy, competitive, rigorous search, and she came out the end of that process. Great. Um, you are on the boards of AT and T and Banco Santander, right? And also in in the Singapore uh, Investment Fund, right? Yeah, GIC. GIC. So talk to us about those and how do those fit together, or do they? Now, so the way they fit together for me, uh, of course, I have uh, fiduciary responsibilities in all three cases that are more important. But for me, uh, AT and T grounds me in what's going on in the United States and in the technology world. Um, Santander's operations are primarily in Europe and Latin America, also important footprint in the United States. And then GIC, which is global, is over in Asia. And they're, I think, the world's most astute and informed China watchers. Um, so that gives those three assignments. I stitch them together in a way to give me a global view to make me a better kind of uh, investor. Uh, and so that's kind of how to think about them uh, in whole. Uh, in each case, there are you know tasks and uh, and strategies that we're putting into place, but those are more for the CEOs to talk about than me. And final question, Glenn: How do you sort of decide how to allocate your time and resources? You have all these different interests as we've discussed. How do you start your day? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I want to do this next year. I want to do this five years from now. What is your thinking? On those terms. So, so my main uh, guidance to young people who come to me and talk about these things is twofold. One is you have to think all of your life about diet, exercise, and sleep. And never lose track of that, those three things structuring your day, your week, your month, your year. Never get outside of that because that's longevity. Uh, the second most important thing is kind of your personal relationships, family, and friends, and having that as the foundation of your life. And then third, pursue something that you're passionate about, um, that as a consequence of which when you get up in the morning and go to work, it's what you want to do that day. And so the, the answer to your question is I get up every morning and do precisely what I want to do that day uh, because I put together this agenda of things that we do. That's a combination of, of uh, investing, uh, corporate service, public service, philanthropy, and, um, uh, and uh, fly fishing. That uh, uh, makes my life uh, full of the passions which I enjoy. Glenn Hutchins, Chairman of North Island, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time. <laughs>